ciao, my name is Chiara and I'm one of the guides from Florian Local Experts and today I'm gonna be taking you around the district of Santa Croce. Santa Croce is an amazing part of the city of Florence, uh, it's one of the four historical neighborhoods and uh, it's really close, to, I mean nowadays it's pretty much within the city center. If you just turn around and take a look down there you can see the tower that belongs to the palace of the government which is of course located in the very heart of the city. So even though nowadays this is one of the most central areas of the city back in the day when the church of Santa Croce was built well this area was rather uh, in the outskirts let's say it was not uh, in the center it was actually outside even of the city walls and this area became more important towards the end of the 1200s when this massive church uh, the church of Santa Croce was built so why was this church built here uh, what's the point of you know building a church outside of the city center well uh, it was the end of the 1200s which is when Florence exploded uh, demographically speaking economically speaking so the city needed bigger palaces of the government bigger city walls bigger churches and whatnot and that's when the Franciscans uh, decided to build a massive basilica here, a massive church here in this part of town. Uh, that's also for practical reason. Uh, the church is here and the river is right behind it. So the river Arno flows right behind the back of this church. So that was a very important economic uh, asset for the city and this area was really well known for the uh, textile dyers for the people that worked in the textile industry so the franciscans came here because this was a very derelict this was a very poor part of the city where actually some heel coming from uh, the church uh, could actually help uh, a lot the people in this area and that's also why you have such a large piazza you see the franciscans they're still in charge of this building uh, they are a preaching order so they needed to actually be able to address and to talk to a lot of people uh, to the uh, people who came to service on sundays uh, and so that's why the piazza is very large so in the past this area has been used uh, mainly for things which have to do uh, you know with the uh, with the church nowadays this piazza is used for a lot of different things and it's very sadly famous also for one other fact which happened in the in the late 60s so come with me and i'm gonna show you what happened in this piazza because uh, of course i mean the building the, ch the church in itself uh, is the star of this piazza but this is also the place where something really um, you know like really uh, well known happened not too long ago and i'm referring to the big flood that took place in florence on november 4th 1966 and if you take a look right up there where you see that plaque that's quite uh, you know like clear it says l'acqua d'arno è arrivata qui 4 november 1966 so the water of the arno river reached this level uh, in uh, on november 4th 1966 so of course that was not that long ago we already had uh, a dam which should have been working and it didn't it was mostly a human mistake the dam was not operated in time so the whole city of florence just from day to night from night to day got completely covered in in water and uh, this area is really close to the river the arno is just one block down this way so obviously this part of the city has been particularly hit uh, by the flood in 1966 and uh, you see uh, the problem has not only been the debris the water of course you know like everything that the water brought with it but the problem is that the city was really different back then nowadays we're lucky enough to have a city which is mostly pedestrian a city which is completely, uh, let's say, uh, rebuilt and uh, thought around people, you know, uh, walking around it. Back in the day, this area was completely open to traffic. Not only the piazza that you see right behind me was literally a parking lot. So a lot of cars parked in this piazza. There was a gas station right next to the Church of Santa Croce. So basically, when the flood happened, it was also a lot of oil and gas mixed in together with the water. So the damages have been, have been huge. And uh, the flood in Florence has had quite severe consequences for a long time. And a lot of people came to help from everywhere in the world. Um, you know, like uh, a lot of people came from the US, a lot of people came from every country in Europe. And these people who came in to help, literally to shovel the mud, 
and to help maybe in the restoration uh, and in the caring of the works of art which had been um, which had been damaged they even got a nickname the angels of the mud so if you look it up on the internet you're gonna find a lot of interesting pictures and a lot of interesting facts about what happened in 1966 so this church uh, we were saying uh, was was built it's a medieval church so it's built towards the end of the 1200s however if you take a look at it you'll notice that the front is really not that medieval uh, you know it's rather similar to the front of other churches that we have in Florence uh, for example it's very similar to the front of the church of, of the cathedral of Florence the Duomo well in fact the facade that you're looking at does not go back to the medieval times this was added much 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 later at the end of the 1800s and it was designed let's say following uh, the colors and the pattern and the style of uh, churches that already existed like the church of santa maria novella and uh, you know it's very similar as we were saying in the style uh, to the to the cathedral and this uh, facade was designed by um, uh, um, a man, his name was Niccolò Matas, and he was a Jewish architect in reality. And that's why you can see that very big Star of David right in the, on top of the church. That's rather unusual for a Catholic church to have, you know, the Star of David uh, so, uh, you know, so, so exposed uh, in the front of the church. But that was a homage that's a tribute to the man who designed the front. And in fact, Niccolò Matas is buried right in front of the entrance door. And we're gonna go see uh, the place where he rests. But before we do that, I wanted to tell you that Santa Croce is not only famous for having the remains of Niccolò Matas, it's mainly famous for having the remains of very important uh, Florentine personalities. And in Florence, we're pretty lucky because we had quite a few personalities. Uh, so we had rather important people buried in here. Michelangelo, just to give you one name, or um, Niccolò Machiavelli, or Gioacchino Rossini, or Galileo Galilei, you know, the famous astronomer. So this became a place mostly known for being the pantheon of Italian glories. But if you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that I skipped a rather important name among this uh, you know, like this, this, this list of names of very important people, I didn't tell you about Dante. Well, Dante is, of course, one of the most relevant, important, famous personalities of Florence. You know, he was a poet, he's been a politician, he's been a writer, he's considered to be the father of Italian language. And uh, notwithstanding all of that, he was actually exiled from Florence for belonging to the wrong political parties. So Dante did not die in Florence, he died in Ravenna. And no matter how hard we tried to get his body back, we never succeeded. So uh, the Church of Santa Croce does not house the remains of Dante, as they're still in Ravenna. But it was still very important to pay this great man a tribute. So not only we have a statue right outside here, we also have a tomb in the in the church. The tomb is empty, as I was telling you, because we never really got the money, uh, the sorry, the the body back. And so this church is really considered to be like a temple with all of the most important uh, people uh, from Florence. But I was telling you at the beginning that also the architect who designed the front is buried right in here and before we go over to our next stop i wanted to show to you uh, the slab the marble slab that you see right here on top of his burial place so you can see Niccolò Matas he was from Ancona and then uh, it says that he was um, he was um, the, the parliament uh, the national parliament uh, thought that he was dignified, he was important enough to be buried in here uh, given the fact that he designed this gorgeous front of the Church of Santa Croce. But I would say enough with uh, this church, let's get to our next stop. make our turn and the uh, workshop we're visiting first is really close and this is Via dei Maci. 
They ma uh, the, the, the Machi was one of the many, many families in Florence and they, uh, they were from this area and in fact they financed a lot of the buildings uh, on, this street, uh, on this street. You know, here there, was, uh, there were a lot of churches and convents and hospitals, so a lot of, let's say, public uh, facilities and structures in this area. And in fact, the workshop that we're going to visit is called La Strucci, that's the name of the business. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a modern uh, workshop and business, but uh, it, it is located in the building that once was um, a hospital, as we were saying. So let's get closer, let's go all the way down. So this place is not just a workshop, this is really a museum that you're looking at. If you uh, look around, you're going to see a lot of things, they uh, look a lot like paintings and it would already be amazing if they were paintings. I mean, if you do take a closer look um, at the frames that you have here on this wall, you can see all the details, you can see the bright colours and again, even if it was just paintings, it would be surprising uh, anyhow. But the point is that uh, what you're looking at are not paintings, you're looking at one of the finest forms of art uh, that we have really in Italy. It's one of the very specific uh, crafts and arts of the city of Florence. This technique is called uh, Mosaico Fiorentino or uh, semi-precious stone inlay. But let me show you where the creation of these incredible things happen. Uh, here you have this part of the workshop. You can see in the back all of the slabs of uh, stones. So what's going to happen? Basically all of those stones are going to be selected, they're going to cut into teeny tiny pieces and they're all going to put together in order to create a design or a pattern or you know like a portrait. But uh, you know I'm not, uh, I, unfortunately I'm not any skilled in this art. Uh, Anna is and here we have a workshop full of like paid people who have really devoted their lives uh, to this art so I would say I should probably uh, just stop talking and give the word to Anna. Okay let me explain you what we are doing here. Um, this is a very antique technique it was born in the end of 1500 and we still uh, do the same things. So everything starts from the drawing on the just the uh, normal paper. Then we cut out a small paper template and we go to to search on the natural stone on the slice, the place with the color we like. Then we stick it on with the beeswax and pine tree resin glue. Is uh, our glue is a traditional recipe, the same from 1500, which we prepare here. And once once sticked uh, a piece, we go to cut it by hand. I can show you how. So this is a just a simple tool. Is a chestnut wood bow, iron wire, which alone doesn't cut anything. But if we add abrasive sand and water get some uh, friction and then in, in this way it's possible to cut very precisely any shape and any stone here you can see the white is a paper template to follow perfectly the shape and this is also wasteless way of cutting because we take only what we need from our stone and then we can keep working with the rest of the slice. We cut it bevel. And 
and of course each stone has different hardness so it depends how hard stone is at the time of cutting and of course uh, the, how complicated is the shape of, uh, of your piece. And uh, then once the piece cut it, is, it doesn't, uh, it isn't ready yet, so we have to file it. You can see Elena is filing and then fit together to other stones. In fact, Italian name is Commesso Fiorentino, Commesso means fit together. And then uh, from the reverse side, when the piece is ready, we'll stick it with the beeswax. Okay, here we can see also others are working. Enrico, he's uh, specialized in flowers working on this uh, iris of Fiordalia, alabaster and uh, onyx uh, many tiny pieces you, you can see but if you just look on it uh, you can't uh, see uh, joints between and after polishing so now he has to wet it but after polishing the colors will remain like that then Jacopo he is working on this uh, detail of uh, Sibyl by Michelangelo is a Delphic Sibyl, the detail from the famous affresco from the Sistine Chapel in Rome and Vatican. Okay, here Bruno, he's working on this uh, landscape, Tuscany landscape. Now I'll show you the final color. Just uh, wash with a sponge. All the colors are completely natural. Let's go to a gallery. Here you can see our exposition. So we don't actually sell uh, online. Uh, we prefer our guests come here inside, get an explanation and can see our beautiful pieces, which are some part is antique from the collection of La Strucci family and all the new pieces we make here. This is an exact copy of the tabletop from the Pitti Palace, 1700. This one has been made in the beginning of 20th century. Very beautiful work, very nice choosing of stones and in this case is a really complicated work because the black background in the beginning is just one piece, is a precious black marble from Belgium, cut through piece by piece and then inlaid all other stones. So it's really, really complicated work. And this is a very beautiful piece just uh, completed. It's about a year of work, a beautiful view of Amalfi Coast with the sea of lapis lazuli and plenty other stones, uh, different types of gabbro, with the, uh, which is the copper mineral. It's about a year of work of uh, everyone here. How much of it like this would it cost? Uh, we have to charge uh, a year of work uh, of uh, all the workshop and also materials. So we could say uh, some hundred thousand of euro. So because uh, uh, hand uh, work is very expensive and they are hours of work, hand cutting, hand polishing. 
here let me show you this is a very beautiful example this is a, a cabinet from 1865 very beautiful collaboration between uh, carpenter bronze maker very beautiful details and of course Florentian music everywhere a smaller small boxes for collection of precious things and when they could keep uh, important papers and so on. This is a particular mosaic because uh, usually is not translucent because we put the, the black uh, slate on the back as a support but in some cases we decide to put the crystal and so if we put the light behind uh, we can get this uh, special effect so we can it can be without and with light so it's done by Bruno Lastruce and this uh, one and a half years of work Plenty tiny pieces inside. So you can notice the same time to do a small portrait and to do big landscape. It's not always about size, but how many pieces, how intricate it is our drawing. Let's go to see a, a, a second room, mind the step. Here I would like to show you our oldest piece. So this is a, a box of ebony wood, bronzes and Florentine mosaic from 1612. So you can see mosaics are still perfect. So thank you very much Anna for showing us around. It's nice to know about you know, the history of this technique and what you guys have in these places is truly amazing. So thank you for making us part of this you know, like magical place. Grazie thank mille. You, thank you. So I, I hope you enjoyed our visit at La Strucci. Now we're about to see something different, a bit more fun, let's say. Uh, and we're gonna meet a very young artist. Her name is Cecilia. And she has one of the most amazing workshops in the city, I think. I really, really enjoy this place. It's just so joyful. Look at all the colors. Uh, she does a lot of different things. But I would say, let's go in and let's ask her because she will know better than I do. So please come with me. Ciao Cecilia. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> oh, grazie. Sorry. So uh, this is the, the workshop where Cecilia works in. And uh, what do you do here? Che fai qui? Yeah, I'm doing scagliola, which is a technique uh, was born of prohibited by marble effect, but uh, it's less expensive because uh, um, I use a full material like gyp gypsum mm -hmm. and glue and colorated pigment. Is all right. So it's basically to get the same effect as the uh, mosaic, as the inlay, but with a reduced price. Yes. And you, um, this is a mosaic, but uh, okay. you can do the same design in another uh, material. And how much would it cost, this one? Uh, this one is uh, a big mm -hmm. piece for me and is um, uh, 10,000. 10,000. Yeah. It's beautiful. There are a lot of colors. It's, yes. it, and it looks very modern. It's, yes. Yeah, it's yes. very... Yeah, a it has a design. Yeah, uh, different not, twist. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, on this other side, uh, what we're looking at is Cagliola, yes. correct? And if you want to see this, I do for explain better the step from the start to the end. Mm -hmm. So you start in this, uh, the black slate is a slate, and uh, I go for first to carve in this way, and then I go to fill it with uh, inlay with uh, the mixture of scagliola, so pigment, glue, and uh, gypsum. And when it's dry and dry by air, 
uh, I go to Polish uh, with uh, another stone, uh, my stone, I don't know Pomestone. how to say in English. Yeah. Pommy stone. stone. And uh, the design can come out. Wow. And so you can uh, go on uh, with another inlay for add more color, or you can uh, just polish uh, and finish uh, right. as you prefer. So when you see the black, the black uh, in the back, is uh, always stagliola. Okay, so it's always like a mixture of different yes. of glue and gypsum and, and pigments. But I also try to do uh, with this technique uh, some uh, different kind of design, much modern like this. Yeah, it's beautiful. Here you have a selection of a lot of Florentine buildings and churches. And this is really what we uh, also came here uh, for. Uh, this is a technique which is very bright, very vivid. And I think it fits very well with more modern designs uh, compared to the mosaic uh, because it gives way to, you know, brighter colors and it lets you play with the design a little bit more. Yes, and you can do many experiments to Now I started to do uh, this technique, but uh, with gold leaf or do something different like uh, this, the dragonfly. Oh, that's beautiful. That looks like, you know, like ancient Asian art or... Yes, uh, it's a... Uh, Okay. Yeah, very beautiful. So there's a lot to try and check. So what's happening in the back there? In the back, uh, she's my, not, I don't know how to say, stagista. Uh, yeah, she's um, apprentice, she's your apprentice. Yes, and uh, she started to go I lay on a slab. Okay. If you want her to go. To yeah, thank you. <laughs> you go. No, you go for her. Thank you. We're sorry. I know we're intruding in your, you know, like in your work day, but we're going to be quick. So this is a slab and she's inlaying it yes. so afterwards you can put in the color. Wow. I think you need a very firm hand yes. and a lot of patience. <laughs> Thank you. Grazie. And so this is a place that you should really visit when you come to Florence. Uh, Cecilia has a little bit of everything. I mean, she's of course uh, specialized in scagliola and you can see the designs are so clean and perfect, but she also does mosaics. Uh, I'm personally in love with this little bird here, for example, or, you know, like with some other things that you can see around. This is really pretty, I think. So, you know, it's, and it's nice to come around this area. This neighborhood is full of artists, artisans, and it's really important to support them. My last one. Wow. And Cecilia. To do the frame now. Right. To give us an idea, how much would something like this be, more or less? This is for four hundred. Four hundred, and it's something unique. I mean, you can repeat the design, but the mix. I repeat this design. I repeat, but it never become the same because change the color, change change the inlay. So it's. Yeah, and it's by hand, so the inlay could turn out a little bit different, or you know, like somehow bigger, smaller. The sky will never be the same. Yeah. So thank you very, very much for your time. Thank we you. love this yeah, workshop and, uh, you know, we... Sorry for my English. No, <laughs> okay. that was perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. So I hope you enjoyed those workshops that we've been visiting. And it's time now for another really uh, special area of the city, a very cool spot, let's say. And I'm really proud to take you here because it's not really that well known uh, from people who are not from Florence. So this is a very local uh, building that we're going to visit. It's called Murate and it's just across the street. And this building used to be a prison and it has been a prison up until very recently. It was only really close in the 80s in the late 80s of the 1900s. So I would say, let's, let's go in. And here 
where we are. This is a place where nowadays you would come for a drink or to meet up with friends. But let me tell you what this building used to be in the past. So we are now in the building of the Murate. As I was telling you, this used to be, this has been a prison for about a century, more or less. But you know, we're gonna get to that. Uh, but before we do that, actually, I wanted to let you into some other facts about this building, as this building has been used for a lot of different purposes. Um, and the first, the very first reason uh, for which this place was even built was to be a convent or a monastery in reality. And uh, from this function also comes the name of this place. I told you the name of it is Murate. Murate in Italian basically means uh, walled in, uh, somebody who is actually within uh, enclosure, within walls. And this was uh, a convent which was donated to an order of uh, nuns who had been, let's say, uh, crazy enough, I should say, to uh, live uh, in isolation on a bridge. So it was an order of nuns who had decided in the 1400s to, uh, to, to live and to stay on the pillars of this bridge in Florence, which is called nowadays Ponte Alle Grazie. So imagine these poor nuns lived in these teeny tiny cells which were built right on top of this bridge uh, of the city of Florence. We were just talking earlier about floods, about the river coming out of its bed, so you can imagine that place was not really the best where to, uh, where to, where to live, and that's why in mid 1400s this big convent was created was donated to these nuns uh, so that they could actually move from the bridge to here and that's why this was called the murate because uh, they were nuns of uh, enclosure i mean they lived uh, uh, without ever coming out of this building and so this place has been a monastery for quite some time and it was only in the mid, mid mid of the 1800s that during the times of Napoleon this place has been suppressed I mean the convent has been suppressed and this building has been used for a lot of different things this has been uh, the place a factory for fireworks at some, at some point this has been the studio of a very famous uh, artist Lorenzo Bartolini at another time but most importantly in the 80s of the 1800s this place became a prison, um, a city prison, and it has been active until the 80s of the 1900s, so until very, very, very recently. And so, you know, we were saying that this place has been repurposed, but once again, you know, in Italy, you can't just destroy something new at its place. So you can still clearly see the doors to the cells. Uh, I mean, now, unfortunately, this one is covered in graffiti, but you can still see, you know, how this was really uh, the place, the door that took you, led you into one of the many cells of this, of this prison. This was a pretty big prison. And then, uh, as I was telling you, the whole, uh, let's say, population of inmates has been moved to Soliciano, which is the current prison, which is, you know, further away from the city center. And then you can see also uh, the hear the, the bells because nowadays you have all uh, you know apartments in this in this area in this in this building or public offices all of the offices that you see they're all somehow uh, about uh, you know development social development opportunities given to young entrepreneurs so it's not only a residential project it's more of a social project that we're looking at uh, with the Murate and now you know like we're slowly slowly walking towards another courtier and as we do so you can really clearly feel the fact that this building used to be uh, used to be a prison but i would say let me take you to another very special place that really gives you that feeling which is this corridor right here and this has been one of the parts uh, which has been remodeled i would say the most if you take a look at the ceiling you can now see that uh, i mean there is no roof or you know there are openings and that's because obviously i mean houses need the natural light to come in but back in the day so up until the 1980s this was completely covered so the, this was a tunnel let's say with all of the cells you know on either side of it and you can see if you take a look up you will see that there are uh, you know, like, you know, like it's normal, I mean, the regular apartment, you can see the uh, clothes hanging or, you know, the pillows in that case, which have been, uh, which are taking some air on the outside. 
but imagine that just up until very few years ago this was this was a prison and this has been sadly famous also uh, during the um, uh, during the flood as i was telling you this area has been particularly hit so you can imagine the conditions in this place during the flood a lot of inmates also managed to escape and to get away from here so that was one of the many reasons uh, that's been one of the many facts for which then the, uh, the prison has been moved. But let's take a look at this other area because we've gone through the uh, place for the yard time just a few minutes before. This was uh, an area that was dedicated to, um, this was a sort of orchard, let's say. This is the place where the inmates could work. Uh, on their um, on, on a vegetable garden in a vegetable garden so this whole area was used for that reason but it's also a great area in my opinion first of all because uh, I really love this mix in between old and new so if you take a look at this, those balconies you can still you can see how modern and how uh, urban they are and you can see at the same time how this building is so ancient and how much uh, you know like history it, it is holding and also in this courtyard there is also one other thing that is really really special which is the church that you see right behind me uh, as we were mentioning before being a prison this place was a convent and so that was uh, a little church that, that was the, the church to the convent uh, which has been uh, already um, not used as a church ever since the, the, the beginning of the 1800s but there is one uh, other place I'd like to show you before, you know, before we end our tour. And it's a place which is not always open, so we arranged to be here today so we can take you in. So let's go take a look. We just have to take a few steps, being careful not to, <laughs> not to trip over. And let's go to uh, actually one of the areas which was uh, part of the, of the actual prison of the, of the cell area. So nowadays you can see again offices here to the right um, and you can see the felt to the left. But what I came here to show you is something in reality uh, more special than that. Even though I need to say that these doors do have a special character. I mean, you can really see, uh, especially on, on the ones inside here without graffiti and which haven't been littered, you can really see how much they have to tell us. But the reason why I came here is to show to you this specific part of the prison complex which, as you can see, is just, let's say, uh, a semi-circular room with uh, three rows of balconies. And you can see that alongside each one of the balcony, you have uh, different cells. You can still see the cells, you know, this part hasn't been changed, let's say, uh, from when this place was a prison. And you can also see that the middle balcony has, uh, at one point, has a bump in it. So there is a, let's say, uh, a lookout point, uh, which is the whole reason why this place has this shape. So this place is called the Panopticon. Panopticon is a, play, is a word that means, uh, pan means uh, global, everywhere, and opticon has to do with seeing. So basically the idea is that uh, only one guard could be sitting on the balcony with the rounded shape, and from there he could actually see, uh, he could actually look after a lot of um, inmates and he could look into all of the cells because he was in a privileged position. And this co whole concept uh, sounds a little intimidating nowadays, you know, having the idea that somebody is always spying on you like a big brother sort of thing. But back then this was something quite revolutionary, this was something quite progressive. After all, we are in Florence, we are in Tuscany, this uh, prison was built uh, in, in mid 1800s, in the 30s of the 1800s, and this was uh, projected. This was built on the idea of the legal of the penal code, which had been completely reviewed at the end of the 1700s by Pietro Leopoldo. Tuscany, Florence, was the first place on earth really to banish um, that penalty, to banish torture as a form of punishment for prisoners. And so this idea was actually quite revolutionary. The idea was that uh, if you're one of the inmates 
And you know that somebody is always going to be watching on you, is always going to be checking on you, then you start behaving in a better way. And so once you're out, back out in the society, you're already going to have a different behavior, you're already going to have a different approach to life because you've been used to uh, being checked. Now, of course, this is not something that we're here to discuss, whether it's a good idea or not. I'm just trying to say that this was something quite modern for those days. And the whole complex was, was quite into the idea of rehabilitating people rather than just punishing them. I've told you about the vegetable garden, uh, this new concept. So this was a modern prison, of course, in the 1800s, not too much, not so much towards the end of its career, let's say. So in the 80s of the 1900s, this was, of course, rather ancient, a rather bad prison. And that's why it's been moved to another place. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today. I hope you had a good time. Uh, I for sure did. I loved walking you around. And yeah, keep following us on, on social medias. And please, please, you know, make sure you do come see us in person because we'd like to meet you uh, once it's possible. Bye.